so let's open in prayer and we'll go from there. Heavenly Father, join us during this time as we gather around your word, as we gather around one of the more significant characters in the biblical account and bring us to greater understanding and greater insight into how you used this one particular individual as well as how you will then use us to proclaim your message as we thank you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so um, good to see a few more of you this week. Um, last week we took, I think probably one of the couple of summaries from last week is as we looked at the scripture, I hope you use that who, what, where, when, why to really ask questions. And even this morning as I was listening to the sermon, you know, last week it was we were talking about how God revealed something to each person about Jesus Christ, but it was something more. You know, he told the wise men one thing, he told Mary another, he told Elizabeth another, he told Simeon another. And the whole idea that we really focused is on was that, you know, God had revealed Jesus to us, but where we're at and what we need to hear. And this morning, I love this season of Epiphany, because this morning it was just, I mean, great, Samuel. I mean, another way that God was revealed to Samuel, and then even Philip in the Gospel lesson. So today we're going to talk a little bit about John the Baptist. And so if you have your Bibles, I would like you to open up to Luke chapter 1, verses 13 to 17, and I would like someone to volunteer to read, please, okay? But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. 17 also. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. My Bible has a big star next to that. All right. Yeah. And this is New King James, so okay, I'm good. just sure it came out a little different. Thank you for reading that. So we're going to do just a little bit like we did last week. So the first thing is, let's talk about what is noteworthy about John's birth. What, just from those couple verses that were read, and even if you know what you know before, what's noteworthy about John's birth? They found out from an angel. They mm -hmm. found out from an angel. Last week we talked about indirect revelations and direct revelations, okay? All right, now let's find angel. What else do we know? What do you know about his parents? They're old. Old. <laughs> that is significant because that is part of how God has worked in history and for the unexpected, unusual, untimely births. And this is another one. This one shouldn't have happened, <laughs> but it did. Okay. Something else from the text there about his birth. We were told what his name should be. Okay, they were told his name. Similar as Joseph was told, you shall call him yeah. Jesus. Mm -hmm. We're going to do a little few parallels between Jesus and John as well this week. They found out the sex without ultrasound. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Okay, two more points I'm looking for in verses 13 and 14. Many will rejoice. Many so will rejoice. So he's going to affect more than just his parents. Mm -hmm. Because it says, you will have great joy and gladness. And then it says, many will rejoice. Um, contrast, you know, who was present at John's birth as opposed to who was present at Jesus' birth. Okay, and one, uh, one last thing about. Well, uh, who do you think the many includes? Jesus. Jesus. Hmm? Jesus. 
sister Joyce when he left in his mother's womb. No, I want Manny. <laughs> That's one. That's a good start. <laughs> and he's big. Jews and the Gentiles. Pretty much covers everybody, doesn't it? Well, how about the nation? In that once word got out about John's birth, I think this was a time in Israelite history after a long period of and what we were reminded of it in the Samuel passage this morning, that the word of the Lord was rare in that day. This was also another period the intertestamental period uh, after the exile, return from the exile, that the word of the Lord was rare. And so when they hear of this miraculous birth, that caused many to perk up their ears and say, ah, maybe now God is back at work again. And I think that's the significance to the news of John's birth. We're also told that when all the neighbors came together and rejoiced at his birth, and then when Zechariah's mouth was suddenly opened, and he did the Benedictus, the bless, you know, blessed be, um, that also great fear fell upon the land. And um, I think the last thing that I just wanted to highlight from verse 13 was, you know, don't be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. So obviously this had been a prayer of his parents for probably many, many years. And I almost want to think is they probably had stopped praying it maybe 20, 30 years earlier, but you know, now it is. It is a prayer. So yes, right. So um, so let's move ahead and let's talk about the how. How is John described in these passages? <laughs> Okay, so he can't, he's not going to drink any wine. What else, how else is he described? Great in the sight Great. of the Lord. Great in the sight of the Lord. And remember when Mary sings her song and the angel says he will be called son of the most high, he will be great. So, so we have some parallels. What else do we have about John here? He's filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. Filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. And, um, you know, we were talking about how the visions were rare in the Old Testament and that. The whole idea of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And we, we saw last week how the Holy Spirit was such a key person. And, you know, it says that, Mary, that um, Elizabeth filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, the baby leaped. We know that Simeon was moved in the temple by the Holy Spirit. So now we're, we're starting to edge on to that new era as we know when the Spirit indwells with us. And the fact that John is filled with the Spirit from birth is an essential part of his development. Because we, have, we know next to nothing about John the Baptist growing up. But we have and will encounter just one and a couple of verses that when you then add to the fact that he's filled with the Holy Spirit, it begins to come together as to what God is doing. So now let's look at his ministry. We heard a little bit about Jesus last week. So, you know, if you want to say, how is John's ministry described? Very successful. <laughs> well, it doesn't say successful, but... Well, you know, he said... He, it says isn't this what everybody well, wants? Cool. Is, is they, they want to bring people to the Lord. All that right, that's what it is. Successful. Right. right, very good. Many of the turn many of the children of Israel will turn. Okay? What else are we told? Uh, the spirit and power of Elijah. And we're gonna talk a little bit more what that means when we get to his public years. But but to think about that. The spirit and power of Elisha. What else do we know? Elijah. Elijah, sorry. And what else do we know about his ministry? Yes, so his ministry was one of, you could put it in a word, was one of turning. His job was to turn the nation. And so the nation must have needed turning. You know, 
that's why John was sent. And notice it says, you know, that phrase is almost like a multiple phrase. He will turn the hearts of the, you know, the parents to their, the fathers to their children, the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. So there's a whole, as, as you think of in the liturgy, you know, what's the word, what word do we use for turn? As part of our liturgy. Repent. Right, repent. Repent. So, so, all right, so now we're going to, we're going to do a real, three things this week. We've just focused on the birth of John. Then we're going to talk about his public years, and then we're just going to hit a little bit on his martyrdom. But there's a very short transition between John's birth and his public years. How much do we know about Jesus in his from his birth to his public ministry? Kind of one incident that really sticks out in our minds, and that's Jesus at the temple at age 12. Well, there's even less than that about John. And that's that Luke 1, verse 80 passage there that is printed on your sheet. Yeah, the very last verse in Luke 1, but it's, it says so much. It says, and the, children, and the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Now take that fact. Uh, he's growing, but he's in the wilderness. He's by himself, but he's not. Because who is with John the Baptist during all those years? Spirit. Hmm? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Exactly. And that's kind of like the forgotten part about John the Baptist. We often think, oh, poor John out in the wilderness eating grasshoppers and <laughs> passing the time. No, he was not just passing the time. He was having a daily encounter mm -hmm. with the Holy Spirit himself. And this is part of the training of God's great people. They all need their time of solitude. And their time where God and God alone can speak to them. Um, that's big, a big part of being prepared. When God wants to prepare the, the biggest of the people that he has prepared, he sends them off on their own for a while. Apostle Paul has his unknown. After his conversion, he disappears. Moses? Moses, very good, <laughs> is, is needed this time to be with God. To be, and now we find out that John the Baptist also was not just passing time in the desert. He was engaged with the Holy Spirit day after day after day. And think about it. What does it mean then if the Holy Spirit is having direct contact with you every single day and what's the Holy Spirit, what we know about him what is some of the things the Holy Spirit accomplishes and, and here accomplishes too isn't this the source of the scriptures all scripture is inspired by God and breathed in by uh, holy, holy men of God moved as it spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so John the Baptist had a direct pipeline to the same person who wrote the Bible. And so even though, you know, listen, he maybe never went to school, but all of what God wanted him to know was infused into him. In the years, and then you think what an incredibly prepared man this was. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's move into his public years and let's take a look at how Mark introduces John the Baptist. And um, I'm still disappointed that we never finished Eric's class on Mark, <laughs> but I have lots oh, yes. of notes from the. <laughs> Please, please. We have lots of notes from it. So I did print out verses. Oh, I didn't give to you. That's right. I have a cheater sheet here for me. 
Um, if someone would read Mark chapter 1, verses 2 through 8. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whom sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Carol. Okay, so now we're getting into the public years, and think of, you know, what was told John's parents at his birth. Now you have a little bit more explanation or more, a little more revelation of it. So what do you learn a little bit more about John's ministry from these verses? He's still out in the desert. Okay. All right. And because he's out in the desert, what's happening? The people are coming to him. The people are coming to him. <laughs> So he did have some degree of attractiveness to him. It was kind of a, a strange attractiveness. <laughs> he, I mean, John is, is described as a not an attractive person. He's a desert dweller, and, and his clothing is non-standard, shall we say. It's itchy. Just like his so he, diet is non-standard. <laughs> yeah, he's crabby. <laughs> and you have to wonder, his parents have been waiting for one to have a baby with a baby visit. <laughs> well, that's an interesting thing. We don't have any idea how long, how long they, they lived. lived. Right. Oh. And, you know, and the other thing is, too, I mean, we know of um, Elizabeth and Zachariah. As I said, um, John came from good stock, you know, if we want to say. I mean, he, his parents were godly, righteous, blameless. I mean, if you look at all what is described in, in Luke earlier in the chapter. So it's like, yeah, John came from a good background. But really the question is how much of an influence and how long of an influence they had on him, we don't really know. So. But then the Holy Spirit takes over from where his parents left off. And again. What a formula for producing a great man of God. And that really ties into the lesson this morning with Samuel, because we know how Samuel, his mother, had prayed for him. And then she took him to the temple when he was weaned. Might have been three, might have been five, you know, but, but still a very young child. And then obviously based on the message this morning in the scripture, you know, Samuel was not growing up in a very conducive place to learning the scriptures and modeling in his life. And so, you know, that I found that was very interesting, you know, when Pastor just noted, you know, that Samuel didn't know the Lord quite like that yet. And and so that is the point, is that, you know, for John too, um, the Holy Spirit does a mighty work in us. So as we talk about the ministry of John the Baptist, we learned a little bit more about here. This is where it talks about a baptism of repentance. So let's talk a little bit about what is meant by that baptism of repentance. People came to confess their sins and ask forgiveness. And that's another thing about John's unattractiveness is a lot of people that want to change their lives will go to something completely different than what they're used to. And if he was unattractive living in the desert and throwing us in the river, okay, it must be good. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I go out there and tell you my sins and that, I can yeah. come back right. and nobody else right. will know of, I mean. Well, that too. And don't, don't go talk to John because he's going to not only tell you what you should be doing, but he knows 
you've been doing thanks to the Holy Spirit in him. It's like this is not a person you would run out to meet. But at the same time, people did. Which, what does that mean? Why are people flocking to him? And again, my best explanation is there must have been a spiritual hunger in the nation that would make suddenly this preacher of righteousness to be an attractive person. It's probably because they even knew, we need this as a country. I need this as a person. And they had to believe it in their heart. Right. And they Anything else on the baptism of repentance? Other than don't confuse the baptism of repentance with our current sacrament of holy baptism. They are not the same. The only thing they have in common is the element. Baptism is simply a word that means apply water. And so when John was baptizing, he went to the place where there was water. Just as now when we have sacra the sacrament of holy baptism, we use water. That's the, the only similarity. But this baptism of repentance was very much a public profession of your own need for repentance. And that was what it was supposed to accomplish. It, it was your chance to go public and confess your sins and um, publicly amend, try, uh, amend your sinful life. Now, did it have, where's the, the power in it other than you would hopefully get in contact with other people who've been through the same experience who realize that they have a need for repentance and they need to amend their sinful lives. And then those people would, and John began to gather disciples of people who realized that I don't like how I'm living and I need to change. Therefore, let's gather in groups and let's do it together. Okay, so the emphasis on, like, I need to change maybe on the baptism, on the, you know, on the, bap the confession and the repentance part. But then if you look in verses 7 and 8, we are told a little bit more about Jesus and his ministry. And what does it say there? He's only the first wave. Somebody coming in next who is even greater, and I'm not worthy. And it's interesting where it says, you know, Jesus is a, I have baptized, with, John says, I have baptized with water, but he will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And it's interesting, when we were doing a little study, there's a number of places where it talks about Jesus baptizing, and people were coming to him, and I don't often think of that, I mean, of people being baptized by Jesus. So when we talk about Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit, then that gets more into God acting on our behalf, and he does the action, and we're not trying to change and do it all on our own. So, In fact, when John first mentions that Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit, I'm, I'm guessing people had no idea what that meant, because the Holy Spirit was not well known you know, as pre-Pentecost had not been poured out on everybody. And then when they knew the individuals in Israelite society who know that, ah, he has the Spirit of God. He has the Spirit of God. And then that, that whole idea that when Jesus comes, everybody's going to have the Spirit of God was just a very foreign concept in the time of John the Baptist. So we're going to move to, open your Bibles to Matthew 11, verses 7 to 15. And so we've had John kind of introducing Jesus. Now we're going to have Jesus introducing John. And so there's a few new things in this verse, or in this passage here. So if someone would be willing to read verses 7 through 15, please. 
nice and loud since the music seems to be getting, his hearing aids don't quite block out all that back noise. So. <laughs> Eric, you want to read it? As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it was written. I will send my messenger ahead of you, and you will prepare your way, and who will prepare your way before you. I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing, and forceful men lay hold of it. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who has come. He, he who has ears, let him hear. Thank you. Okay, so here's a few things repeating themselves a little bit again. So um, we hear John's, we hear Jesus' words. And what Old Testament prophecy is he referring to? In verse 10, Isaiah, right, mm -hmm. that was the same one, you know, the messenger in the wilderness go out, and um, and then, you know, he talks a little bit about um, he will prepare the way, and that, that's obviously what was told us in the first passage about John's birth, that he would prepare the way, and then when we read the Mark passage, it also talks about going out in the wilderness. So it's neat to see how these things all interface. But what I want to spend a little bit more time about is verse 14. If you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. So why do you think John was called Elijah? Well, to fulfill a uh, prophecy. Okay. To fulfill a prophecy. <laughs> about style. A little confrontational, perhaps. <laughs> but also a conversational. She did. Yeah, she said confrontational. Confrontational. Also, Elijah never died, so they always thought he was going to come back and usher in the king. Mm -hmm. But it, it, me, he, he was many times mistaken as the Messiah. So when we talk about John's style and so forth, the thing that came through is, is the power of the gospel. Why in the world would people leave this very gorgeous, fancy temple where thousands, 3,000 could sit deep, deep just on the porch, Solomon's porch? Why would they leave all of that? Because they were not getting the word of God in Jerusalem anymore. And so that's why they would go out and sit in that 130 degree temperature <laughs> and, and listen because the part, the part, you know, St. Paul says, uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power, the dynamis, the dynamite of God, and that's what's exploding right here. And when Eric was reading, too, that, I mean, we talked about this last night, but just the whole idea is that um, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence. Your translation was a little different, Eric, but mine says the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. So you're right, there is, people aren't hearing God's word, there, there is persecution, and there's just a suppression of the truth. The truth is not being told. Or, and also with that suffering violence, I mean the kingdom of heaven advances when people kick butt and take names. Because it does not move quietly and silently. But the kingdom of heaven advances violently. It shakes things up. And Elijah was the perfect example. Elijah went head to head with probably one of the worst kings in Israelite history. And his wife, Ahab and Jezebel. And they and so Elijah did not mince words. I think that's 
how the kingdom of God advances as well. And so John the Baptist, in the spirit of Elijah, was probably one who did not mince words. Okay, let's move on. And this was Robert's big thing, so I'm going to let him do a little bit more on this John chapter 3, 22 to 30. And he calls John as the best man. And so we are going to take a look at John chapter 3, verses 22 through 30. So first remember that the gospel of John is much more a hindsight gospel. It is not a concurrent narrative gospel, but rather it's John takes the events, maybe even not in chronological order, and looks back at them and reflects on the significance. And this is what's happening here. Uh, John chapter 3, of course, is the, the famous born again verses and the uh, John 3.16. But now we are much later in that same chapter, at 3.22. So someone willing to read from 22 to 30, please? After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside, where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now John was also baptizing at uh, Anan near Salem, Salem, because there was plenty of water and people were constantly coming to be baptized. There was before John, this was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and the certain Jews a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, well, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. So there we have the narrative says that Jesus was baptizing. It's like, we well, didn't all hear about that, but here's evidence that indeed it happened. And we have John baptizing and Jesus baptizing. And now the inevitable question happens. And one says, Who, whose side are you on? Or are we following different people or following the same person? And that's then what this narrative, uh, what John then answers at uh, 27. To this John replied, a man can receive only what is given him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Christ, but I am sent ahead of him. The, bridge belong the bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. He must become greater, I must become less. And that also gets into the whole thing we talked about, many would rejoice at John's birth and that. You find this whole theme of joy so often mentioned, and I think sometimes we overlook at it, we overlook it. But verses 29 and 30 are kind of where we're gonna zoom in right now. So, um, we talk so any, anyone ever, uh, you got guys, any guys here, have uh, you got to be best man? What's the role of a best man? You have to be best man sometimes? I did. I, you know, first you have to throw the party for it. <laughs> <laughs> but then you got to make sure the groom gets to the, uh, to the wedding. And to the wedding. <laughs> Change his <laughs> mind. <laughs> yes, what was my function as best man for my brother's wedding? Yes, I got to drive. <laughs> But the whole idea is that you are the number one personal attendant of the group. And so your job is to meet the groom's every needs and, and, and talk up the groom. That's why what's, what, even in today's weddings, what's the main function of the best man at the wedding and at the reception? Give the toast. Give the toast. <laughs> Because the purpose of giving the toast is to talk up the groom. And so that then John sees himself in that role. He also, this is one of those passages where John sees his role 
coming to an end. But I found personally interesting, John. John comes out and says, well, my job's done. I've introduced the, the groom to everyone, and from now on, take it away, bridegroom. And that's exactly what happens. So in, even in spite of you know, John's untimely death, that was obviously not his intent. But his intent was, after introducing Jesus, now I decrease. Now I fade into the background. Which is kind of hard to, uh, for a rather aggressive guy like John to even admit. What does it mean that Jesus is the bridegroom? Well, first of all, John announces Jesus in bridegroom terms. And so, if you're going to have a bridegroom, what's the surrounding event? The wedding. The wedding. And this is where you begin to see the talk about Jesus is the bridegroom, and that he then comes to essentially bring us all to his wedding. And that's part of, uh, we'll get this next week, uh, that's our segue into next week, where the, the epiphany encounter is the water in the wine, where Jesus attends a wedding and can't help himself because he sees everything happening around him that will remind him of, yes, this is what the culmination of my work will be. After my death, after my resurrection, you're all invited to the wedding. And we will come and gather and rejoice and the prophecies of Isaiah will come true in that there will, the wine will flow in abundance and the celebration will never end. And so that's uh, what is hinted here at this passage of John talking about Jesus as the bridegroom. That's just looking ahead, looking ahead, looking ahead. And it still is the, the perfect imagery of, as far as I'm concerned, what will heaven be like? Just think of the best wedding you've ever been to. And all of us have great weddings we've been to. What makes them great? Well, you know, the beer's always cold. And it never runs out. And it never runs out. The wine. Yeah. It doesn't wine usually turn there. from water to wine. There's, but there's an equivalent there. You know, so. But it's, and the rejoicing never stops, and the music never stops, and the celebration never stops. And if that's what heaven's going to be like, it's like, come <coughs> in, come in. I look forward to that. It doesn't take a So we talked about it. Excuse me, I was going to say, we're, we're seeing too, <coughs> that this early part, that Jesus is beginning to use this concept, bridegroom and Right. Who's the bride? We are. The church. And you're, you're, you're saying in heaven, that is the ultimate. Jesus uses the marital kind of language as, as a union, much like that with our spiritual relationship with him. And he often, we're going to hear more and more of this, <coughs> that we are the groom and, and he is bringing us to, to the right in, in the union he wants. And this morning, too, is interesting as you, you know, as you have prepared and then you listen to scripture and that in a new light. And so then this morning we're talking about Solomon. And obviously he kind of went, was not wise <laughs> in his decisions that he made. And, um, but, but that whole idea of even the sec the first Corinthians passage about, you know, that our bodies are not, you know, are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And, and just what, um, how the picture of that is a, as a reflection of. 
Mm -hmm. The other thing I'd fascinated with the, I never seen this before, the friend who attends the bridegroom weeks and listens for him, as full as joy and hears the bridegroom's voice. We lose that in our wedding traditions today. Because in the Jewish wedding, mm -hmm. the br bridegroom left and went to build the house at the father's house. Mm -hmm. And then he would come back and it was surprised. They didn't know that was the story of the ten virgins, the five who had the oil and the five who didn't. You will come back and surprise them and say, this is the day and the wedding just happens. And here the, the friend is waiting to hear the voice. Because then he rejoices because that means the wedding's going to happen. And that was John's function when he saw Jesus. Again, and I think later in that other passage where he, after he was put in prison, are you really the one? Now, even he doubted a little bit. Are you really the one? Because he wanted to know for sure. Where's the wedding? That's right. Are you the one? the wedding? Point. Any other points on this? I, w I was th I was thinking of like how would we feel if we got this wedding invitation in the mail and there wasn't the date on it? <laughs> you have We're that, supposed to sit around. <laughs> the wedding. If you have that. It's called Judgment Day, and we don't know what's going on. We have the invitation right here. Right? Right. Right. It will oh, happen. Yeah. Be ready. But you know we. We, we exist in the McDonald's syndrome, mm -hmm. which means I want it, and I want it right now. <laughs> you know, I want it to happen now. And, and we're a little bit impatient about things. And that's not good. We have to be ready. And we'll talk a little more about the wedding and the procession and everything and how they came um, next week. Um, we did start a few minutes late, so we've been kind of rushing a little bit. But we're just going to touch on the martyrdom of John the Baptist. So if you can open your Bibles to Matthew 14, we'll take a look at verses 1 through 12. Susie, you want to read this one? At that time, Herod was in charge. Heard the reports about Jesus and he said to his attendants, This is John the Baptist. He has risen from the dead. That is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Now Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herod, Herodias, Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had been saying to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. Herod wanted to kill John. Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias, Herodias, sorry guys, <laughs> danced for the guests and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. The king was distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted and had John beheaded in the head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. More? Okay. <laughs> um, so why was John killed? Was he pointed out here at the sin? Simple. <laughs> And that gets back to when you were talking about John had a confront, confrontational ministry. So there are consequences when you are willing to stay, take a stand and do something like that. And, um, you know, and interesting, it says, you know, at first it says Herod wanted to put him to death, but he feared because he was a prophet. And then when he gets his wish to put him to death, then he's sorry because he doesn't really want to put him to death. And so I close with a question, was his death, meaning John's death, a precursor of Christ's death? And was this really part of his mission from the beginning? Of course it was, because that was God's plan. <laughs> so why he, they had a baby in the first place. That's right. Well, didn't, didn't they also need 
people that were still attracted and wanted to follow John, um, that needed to end. Oh, oh, that, oh, good point. And, yeah. and so by Herod killing him off, his disciples buried him, John's disciples buried John, and then went to Jesus and told him. Yeah. So in that sense, John's death was necessary yeah. to prevent splitting the flock, as it were. And there was some of that earlier where they said, uh, well, I'm John's disciple, you know, and, and you know, somebody says, so it's... Does this have to be put out of the ladder? That was the request, I guess. Well, that was quite public. It was done. So, all right, do you want to close with some prayer? Thank you. Discussion together and let us pray. We do thank you, Lord God, and thank the Holy Spirit for working through your word and in the hearts of your people to uh, open our hearts and minds to the uh, essential ministry of this uh, martyr who uh, gave his life in the proclamation of the message of the Christ. May it embolden us to also speak boldly and to take risks on behalf of standing up for the faith and enable us and give us the power, the grace, and the opportunity to do it as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And next week there won't be communion again, so we didn't do our little icebreaker in that this morning because we started a little bit later. But so realize that you'll get done earlier and That's we can start by 9.15. And yes, I did do the answer sheet, although I want to clarify that this is not necessarily the answer sheet. It's just what we put together. So here's the answers if you want to, our thoughts that we put on. And um, my apologies for not being able to get these on the... Uh, <laughs> but,